Hey guys, I'm Mountain Fiber, and today I'm going to be diving right into the tumultuous making of process for the latest addition to my 1910s wardrobe, the Elsie blouse from Wearing History. This pattern is directly taken from a late 1910s original, but has been graded for a wider range of sizes. The instructions are also from the original, with slight updates to the language for clarity. This means they are very limited instructions indeed. I assembled and cut out my PDF pattern, no problems there and laid the pieces out on my fabric, an ultra-fine and quite sheer striped cotton dobby. Then I cut out the fabric. You may notice that I am leaving a large and frankly uneven seam allowance as I cut. This is because I did not bother to closely read the instructions. Seams are in fact already included in the pattern pieces with no extra allowance necessary. This mistake haunted me for the rest of the project. Anyway, here I am reading the instructions for assembly tantalizingly close to realizing I had made a mistake, but not quite. I started by sewing the facings to the front of the bodice. Then I ran two rows of gathering stitches along the front bodice shoulders, and gathered them down to match the shoulders of the back bodice piece. Look at that painfully uneven seam allowance situation. Absolute madness. Fortunately, I matched according to the notches I had cut rather than the edges of the fabric. I attached the bodice pieces at the shoulders using flat felt seams, which is what I used for pretty much every other seam on this garment. I love this method of finishing seams, and it was recommended for blouses of this type in a 1917 dressmaking manual. You prepare the seam allowances as though you were going to hand fell them down, one wider and one narrower, with the wider one folded over, and press down, concealing both raw edges. Then you top stitch along the edge of the seam allowance by machine. The top stitching is visible running alongside the seam on the right side of the garment. Then I sewed up the sides of the blouse and flat felled those seams as well. Next up were the sleeves. The facing for the sleeve placket was just a small rectangle of fabric with notches, and it wasn't until I referenced the instruction booklet for the Folkwear Armistice blouse that I understood the method, since minimal instructions were included with the Elsie blouse pattern. Basically, you take the bottom edge of the sleeve, separate the slit you cut so that it's a straight line, and attach the placket facing, matching the notches, right sides together. Then you sew along that edge, press the seam, fold in the raw edge, fold the facing in half, and whip stitch it in place on the other side. The hardest part is getting the stitching to be straight when you reach what would be sort of the apex of the slit because the fabric wants to pull and wobble and bunch up in all kinds of maddening ways and if it does then the placket won't lie flat. Then you need to top stitch around the placket in order to secure it to the sleeve so that it doesn't sort of pop out and come out of place and show when you're wearing the blouse. Next up, sew the sleeve seams, flat felling the raw edges. Is this difficult to do when the sleeves bunch up? Yes, but there's no solution for it, you just have to push on. Then sew gathering stitches along the bottom edge of the sleeve from one side of the placket to the other, and gather down to fit the cuff, which means it's time to actually start working on the cuffs. By this point, I'd realized that I had made a terrible mistake, not only because I added seam allowances when I didn't need to, but also because they were so random and uneven. This all came to a head with the cuffs. Basically, the cuffs were just way too wide. I could have simply reduced the amount of gathering in the sleeves to match, but that would have resulted in loose cuffs which didn't fit my wrists. Cutting the cuffs narrower would reduce their length as well. Because of the points, you'd have to like adjust everything, and I really couldn't do that because I do have long arms and I needed to preserve as much length as possible. So I compromised. I re-sewed the cuffs and their facings with a wider seam allowance, and then just resigned myself to having an extra wide overlap where the buttons would go. You'll see later on what I mean. I attached the cuff and the sleeves right sides together, making sure that the facing layer of the cuff was free. 
The shorter, narrower slotted side is meant to go under the straight side, so it's important to orient the cuffs such that the little underlap part corresponds with the underlap of the sleeve placket. Otherwise, big trouble. Then I whip stitched the facing edge down to the inside of the cuff. The sleeves were, of course, far too large for the sleeve hole, which I realized after I'd already flat felt the seams and attached the cuffs. Are you sensing a trend here? It was too late to unpick all my work, so I simply gathered the sleeve heads to fit. I pinned them in, attached them, and then pondered over how to finish those raw edges. I decided to make my own double-sided tape. I cut a one-inch strip of the blouse fabric, folded and pressed the edges inwards, sewed one side down to the sleeve's seam allowance, then folded it over and felled it by hand. It was a neat, easy, and period-appropriate solution. By this point, it was the holidays. Since traveling to see my family was out of the question, I decided to go with a friend to the coast where we spent long hours exploring empty beaches and hunting for fossils. We also picked up two absolutely delightful Edwardian petticoats at an antique mall. I got mine as a reference piece to add to my collection, since I don't wear antique garments. In addition to all the gorgeous lace and ruffles and pin tucks, my favorite thing about this petticoat is that it has the same exact waist measurement as I do. I was not expecting that at all, and it was a lovely surprise. You can definitely expect a future video looking at the petticoat in depth, and possibly a recreation of it as well if I can get my hands on 3 inch wide Valenciennes insertion lace. Then it was home for the new year, and time to go back to sewing. I started by joining the collar and facing. Then I felt down the facings on the front of the bodice since they needed to be finished before attaching the collar. I had plenty of problems throughout this project with pressing seams. Since the fabric is so delicate and wibbly and the shapes of the pieces are often quite odd, but I found that I could just wad up a clean dish towel, and that provided enough structure for me to press open a very narrow, curved seam. Now it was time to attach the collar. I pinned the collar to the neck right sides together, leaving the facing layer free, but ended up taking it apart since the neck was several inches longer than the collar, due, once again, to my miscalculations way back in the beginning. To solve this problem, I brought in the lapel seam slightly and slip stitched the two sides together. Then the collar fit pretty much perfectly. I sewed the collar to the neck hole, right sides together, then flipped it out, pressed in the facing edge, and whip stitched it down. Then it was time to hem the blouse. I trimmed the front of the bodice and facing pieces to be straight across rather than angled downwards, and pressed up a quarter inch twice, creating a hem which I then top stitched in place. Per the pattern illustration, I decided to top stitch an eighth of an inch around all edges of the blouse, which helped prevent the facings from getting baggy and made the points of the cuffs and the collar crisper. <laughs> 
Then I went through my button collection to find enough matching pearl buttons for the front and cuffs of the blouse. I have a random assortment of buttons from the early to mid 20th century which I got for cheap at a recycled craft supply store. And I really love using antique buttons for historical projects. I marked out the button and buttonhole placements on the cuffs. and then consulted with an original early 1910s blouse from my collection to see firsthand how the buttonholes were finished. Before handling any antique clothing, of course, I always wash my hands carefully and lay it out on acid-free tissue paper. The buttonholes on this blouse are so tiny and neat and finished with a very tight buttonhole stitch with cotton thread held singly. Mine did not turn out quite so beautifully, but that's all right. I followed the buttonhole stitch tutorial on Bernadette Banner's page using doubled thread for reinforcement. Then I sewed the buttons onto the cuffs and down the front of the blouse. I omitted a waist tie although the original pattern actually calls for one. Could also do an interior drawstring channel along the waistline, but I rather like it as a loose blouse over high-waisted jeans. I can also tuck it in for a more historical look with my recently made 1918 pleated skirt. I really recommend this pattern. The end result is just so pretty. And I also recommend reading the instructions all the way through so that you can avoid making the same mistakes I did. I'm going to be taking the rest of January to work on my entry for the Foundations Revealed competition, but I wanted to thank you all for watching and subscribing. It really means the world to me. So I hope you'll stay tuned for more to come.